Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. This is episode 501. Just coming off episode 500, baby. How's that feel? Oh, it's crazy. I mean, you're talking five and a half years doing the podcast, hitting 500 episodes, man. And uh, episode, no five, episode 500 is a, a fun one. Um, yep. J- well, before we get into that, it's been so busy the last few weeks for us. Uh, not only kind of doing the episode 500, but like, you know, we were at the, the Southern uh, Mobile Hunters Expo. We were at the World Air Expo in Birmingham, Alabama. And then we went, I went to the Northern Mobile Hunters Expo in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Yep. It's been insane recently. Um, but yeah, super awesome. So it's, yeah, it's crazy. Episode 500. Um, and dude, it, it was cool getting all the feedback from all those listeners, like all those individual interviews and like some of the stories there. Again, yeah. I still go back to that. That's the, um, the interview with Tracy, uh, Brooke, uh, talking about just how much he had learned in one year from like Man. not killing any deer to the first year on public land, hunting first year with a bow, killing eight deer with a bow, Two bucks with a rifle, should have tagged out with another buck with a bow and just didn't recover that deer. Uh, just craziness, dude. Yeah, just that's, gets me a, excited. That, that's a really, that's an awesome story. And man, like, I hope Tracy knows the the uh, impression that made on you because I've heard that story probably about 18 times by now. Oh. Like, you just tell, you were telling everybody that story, man. My favorite story. You told the guy we interviewed last night that story. Yep. I mean, like, yeah, all kinds of people, man. Uh, yeah, no, it was fun. Um, we weren't really sure what we wanted to do for episode 500 because we were, we talked about doing a, like a round table thing, mm-hmm. which we got one planned, uh, but we weren't able to make it happen in time. Uh, so we're like, what should we do for episode 500? And we were at the deer show and we were talking to all these people and I was like, you know what? Like, why don't we make this the, the deer show? And one thing that I was telling a lot of the guys that were coming by the booth that we were talking to is, um, their story is probably really helpful for people out there mm-hmm. because, you know, all the listeners, they're they're getting the same information with every podcast, but everyone's applying it different. Yep. And hearing how someone actually applies that, like an example I like to use for people is our buddy Nick Adair with Gun Dog It Yourself. You know, me and Jacob have gun dogs now. And some of the most helpful episodes that Nick did, you know, he, he does a show similar to ours. He'll have an episode with an expert mm-hmm. where he goes really deep on like some kind of training technique. And those are really good. And I'm still new with dog training, like specifically gun dog training. So when I listen to that, sometimes it's overwhelming. Sometimes I like, you know, I'm just not quite putting two and two together because it's still like pretty foreign to me and pretty advanced. And then he'd have a a GDIY profile episode where he'd have a listener on Mm -hmm. and that listener would be like, oh yeah, when so-and-so talked about this, you know, I went and did this with my dog and I got this reaction. So then I heard this. And you're hearing how that person took the original information and applied it and then basically troubleshot that information yep. and took it and said, okay, when I actually tried this, this is what happened and this is what I did. you know. And that, those, I was telling Nick, I'm like, I, I kind of get more out of those than I do out of your normal episodes, to be honest with you. Because it's the application of that information, you know? Yeah. So, so I was excited to do that, this for that reason. I'm like, what, what, you, what you guys are telling us on the podcast right now is going to help so many people. Like because it's just a new, fresh perspective, and uh, and it's real world application. That's super valuable. Yeah, yeah. It's it's all about how do you take it from an episode and what a guest talks about, or like what's discussed on the show, and then go out there and actually apply it. Because that's that's like the million dollar question. Like, how do you go and apply it? Yep. And that's a good analogy. Like we're talking about with the gun dogs with our, with our dogs, and, and Nick showed it's like you know trying to do force fetch right now with my dog and it's just like <laughs> god it's there's a lot going on you hear uh, you hear the force fetch series he did and you're like okay i got it and then you start doing it you're like huh yeah i'm like ah <laughs> oh. so i like now i know what like a, a newer deer hunter thinks about when they listen to our show I'm yeah like, there's real. a lot of nuance to this and a lot of complications uh but again it kind of comes down to experience but yeah it was fascinating hearing all the different stories from all these guys that have had mixed results. You know, so, some guys we had on the podcast on the on this episode, episode 500, you know, have had tremendous success applying things that they've heard from the podcast. And then other guys, maybe they're still just trying to work through it. Like they kind of understand some stuff, but they just haven't had that success quite yet. But, but their knowledge base is building. It's just going out there and personally experiencing and, and building more woodsmanship and knowledge in the field is what they're still trying to work on. Um, and it's just, and I'll be honest, one of the commonalities between everybody was focusing on putting more time in the woods and, and always, and, and a lot of guys, especially I had interviewed, uh, and you too as well on the episode, was like kind of the whole idea of asking why. Mm-hmm. Like, why are they not seeing deer? Why are they seeing deer? Why are they not seeing the sign? Why are they seeing the sign in specific areas? 
and then kind of building that together to figure out, you know, that pattern, not ne- not necessarily using trail cameras, but the pattern of where the deer are at at certain times of the season and be able to get in there and get opportunities at, at killing a buck. Yeah, so, yeah, definitely. That's uh, like that's like flipping the light switch on. It's like that's when you really get started is when you that flips in your head and you start asking why. You know, that's like, uh, that's like the first step to yep. the rest of your, you know, deer hunting life. Yeah. You know? and, and also another thing with it is – how some listeners may take something from a specific episode or, or a specific topic and apply it a different way than maybe we would apply it, but mm-hmm. they're still having success. Like there's oh. a Jude from Georgia. I think you yes. had talked to. Yes. Uh, is it Ben? Yeah. Ben DeWitt. Um, I talked to him and he had, he'd actually written in with a listener success story and that listener success story had posted like a day or two before the show. Hmm. And so it was kind of fresh on my mind. And when he walked up, I was like, he looks kind of familiar. And he said, said his name. I'm like, okay, yeah, I know who you are. Yeah. And we got to talking about his deer and he explained some of it in the listener success story that we posted on our Facebook page of how everything went down with that deer. And then I interviewed him. I don't think you were on that one. No, I wasn't. Uh, I interviewed him on the show and we got his thoughts and everything. And I was like picking his brain because I'm very curious because I've hunted Georgia. I, I haven't hunted where he was, but I've hunted sim- very similar stuff. And there's a lot of stuff in Alabama here that's really similar to where he was hunting. And after we got off, he's like, well, let me just show you. And he pulled out the map and started zooming around where he actually killed that buck. And I was like, that's what you were hunting? Like, it was the secondary ridge points he was talking about were not, like, if I do a mapping video, I'm, like, on on the mapping videos on our YouTube channel, I'm always pointing out secondary ridge points that are, like, blatantly obvious, like, ridges. Yeah. He was hunting something where his secondary ridge points were, like, just a slight bend in the topo lines. Mm -hmm. And, you know, using Onyx, there's, like, one or two topo lines for, for this whole hill, because it's not a very big hill. Yep. And those are the secondary ridge points that he's focusing on. And I'm like, mm. okay, I just learned something. You know, like in, in this instance right here, I just learned like how you're targeting that. And it helped me put two and two together, you know. So I'm always trying to learn too. But that was really interesting, just seeing how he took it and applied it totally different than than I would, mm-hmm. you know. So now going into Georgia this year, a little – well, actually, we're not hunting a place, anything like that. No, but. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not anything like that, but yeah. Yeah. But, but no, that's uh, it, it, again, that's kind of fascinating. Like, we had one guy who came on, I think we interviewed him. Um, the gentleman that he killed 240 plus inch deer in Alabama within 10 days apart on a small parcel after taking some uh, um, some some uh, information from the podcast. And I, I'm, I'm trying to remember if I, I don't if know, we, man. I don't know if we, that was interviewed. a crazy, crazy couple of days that got all kind of runs together. Well, it, it was crazy because we had certain listeners that were coming in and like, you know, a lot of guys, they're, you know, listener success stories walk around. I talked to quite a few of them. Some didn't want to be on the podcast, and then uh, some did. But it, but it, it's kind <laughs> yeah, of it's kind funny. of funny um, that just the, the differences of, like, some of these people and, like, where they've been hunting in Alabama or Georgia or Tennessee and Mississippi and, like, the different levels of success when it comes to, like, different size deer that they're killing. Like, yep. like that, that, that one gentleman that he killed the two 140s, that was uh, – um, west of Birmingham with some private property he's got and uh, kind of more, you know, that central part of Alabama, north central part of Alabama, uh, was just impressive. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he was taking notes from a couple of different guys that talked about, you know, kind of, you know, watching your does, managing your does, and all that property management side of stuff, and timed it up perfectly where he went in and in 10 days killed two hammers in Alabama. Like, killed two deer in Alabama that most guys will never kill, yep. to be honest. Yep. Like, always, we always talk about on some podcasts and other guests that, you know, I know a lot of super successful uh, whitetail hunters in like Alabama and the Deep South, who's uh, probably never broke that 130 inch mark. Yeah, doesn't mean they're a bad hunter. They still kill a lot of mature bucks, mm-hmm. but it's just they're in areas that it's hard to find that kind of caliber yeah. of deer. Um, and you know, this guy is in a part of the state that you know you have some pretty big deer, but he was able to capitalize on two fantastic bucks in mm-hmm. literally a short window of time. Um, kind of like some guys who went from being guests of the or being listeners of the podcast to being guests of the podcast, uh, Chase Parker and uh, Haynes Riddle, yep. where they killed three bucks in, I think, 10 or 14 days on public that well, I think the smallest year was 141, 142-inch buck, yep. and the two biggest ones were in the low 150s mm-hmm. as mainframe eight points. Um, and again, that's kind of awesome. And that's that's kind of like a goal with like the show is like, I, I love the idea of, when a guy can become go from being a listener to starting to put stuff together to becoming extremely successful in a couple of years to then going successful. Yeah, to then going and becoming a guest of the show. Yep. 
Like that's the el- that's the el- uh, evolution of the podcast that gets me so excited yeah. when we have guys like that. And we've had quite quite a few on the podcast like that now. Uh, mm-hmm. Who's been listening for three or four years? And they went from just being a listener to now being a guest of the show. I'm like, man, you got something to show. So if you're yeah. out there watching and listening, you could very easily become a guest here in the next year or two. You know, mm-hmm. you keep staying successful and you know using yep. things you're learning from the show and putting stuff together because there's always something to learn from different people, no matter the skill set, no matter you know, their experience level, you know, you might learn something that we don't know about or we haven't really discussed before that's really successful for you and it might make for a great episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, that just goes back to what we're saying. Like these guys who, there, there was a lot of them who came by the booth and, and we were talking to them about their success and you're like, well, come on, let's get on the podcast. And they're like, what? <laughs> you know? And you just handed them a headset and they're like, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, but there's something to take from it. And, and a lot of those guys, you know, like, we have we have a great community, and a lot of people we talk to are like very very humble mm-hmm. about what they've actually accomplished. And the listeners who we talked to from this past Monday are no exception to that. You know, a lot of them were like, "Well, I mean, like, I think I'm okay," but it's like, "Man, look at what you've done! Like, you've you've done some really good stuff." And there's something to be taken mm-hmm. from that. You know, even if if you go out there and you find your first success on a mature buck, it's like, "Well, what'd you do different? Like, what clicked for you?" And especially uh, newer hunters. Mm-hmm they always seem to have a pretty interesting perspective um, because they, they're not coming into it with all the preconceived notions, all the wives' tales that maybe we grew up with, like people who have been hunting since they were kids. And uh, they just have kind of a weird way of looking at things sometimes. Yeah, Michael Pike is a good example. He, he did grow up hunting, but he kind of got out of it and then got reactivated, like got back into it. And, you know, he just thinks really off the wall. He doesn't mm-hmm. think like, you know, everybody in deer camp growing up thought. Yeah. Um, and so I think that is super valuable. I think there's always something to be, you know, gleaned off of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. It was fun, dude. It was really fun. Um, do you have, you have anybody in particular who's your favorite besides, besides the one that you tell everybody about? Tracy Brooke, number <laughs> one. I'll tell you another one that was really good is, uh, I think his name is Jake Sharp. Mm-hmm. You actually ran into him back. I don't even know if we had started the podcast quite yet on a piece of public. In South Alabama? Yes. Yeah. Yep, and uh, yep. Or, or, or maybe we had. I think he said we had just started it because he's been listening yeah. for a long time. I remember because I I drove by him and he was he was dragging a buck out, and I passed him and went, drove like forty yards past him. I was like, well, let me just go talk to this fellow, and I threw it reverse and backed <laughs> up. <laughs> and, you know, we got to talking about that deer and everything. And well, and, and one thing that he I, I kind of took away from him is you know he's learning some different things from the show, but the success he's had on that parcel public, uh, hunting off the ground with a bow. Yeah. And you know, just killing some great freaking deer, uh, and, and that was that was super interesting. So it, it was, uh, you know, he he was another good one that I thought was kind of fascinating, kind of picking stuff apart. Um, there was another guy, and oh my god, I'm blanking on his name. Should have had everybody's names right now. <laughs> who uh, was hunting a little bit more kind of a uh, river bottom habitat um, mm-hmm. in Alabama, who come to find out after uh, i think i made a story or something and took a took a video and posted it our buddy kyle sides knows him mm. and he's like that dude would kill some hammers he's like he yeah. was extremely humble in the podcast but he kills some huge deer really? down there in that area that, <laughs> might that, need to track him back yeah, down yeah, that area of the state <laughs> uh so you know that that's kind of cool as well because that's the one thing i love about especially a lot of listeners I, and i think it's because you get so many guys on, on the podcast who are extremely successful you know, in their area of the country, whether it's in the Southeast or maybe we get a guy from not in the Southeast, but most of these guys are so humble and like what they do, they don't think they're doing anything necessarily special. They just want to kind of share and help other people become more successful. Yep. That it almost translates over to a lot of the listeners. Mm-hmm. Like I've never really met a listener. I can't recall that was like, not kind of humble about what they're learning and everything. Yeah. It wasn't like an ego trip of like, look what I've done. It's mm-hmm. like, oh yeah, man, kill some good deer. Nothing crazy. You yeah. know, all that kind of stuff, which is awesome. So it's kind of like kind of building that culture of, you know, successful hunters that also, you know, are humble as well and are willing to kind of, you know, share with others of what's kind of helping them become successful. Yeah. Um, and I think that's just an awesome kind of culture aspect that I feel like, you know, we're kind of building with the show because you and me, we talk about our failures all the time. It's mm-hmm. just like, you know, we're all going to fail. I mean, even guys like, you know, Michael Perry's been doing it for so long, okay? Yeah. And he's been on the podcast a ton. You know, he's constantly learning different things and how to become better and better. And it's like you never get to a point when it comes to whitetail hunting where you – have everything figured out. Like if you ever get to that point, 
I feel like the guys ever get to that point almost regress a little bit because they don't try to keep learning more. I was just about to say that, and we know some guys like that, mm-hmm. you know. And yeah, I think you're definitely right. But that's a that's a huge thing, the culture aspect, you know. And I, I think that's you hit it on the head. Like that's something intentional that we do. We want to be a positive influence on on like hunting culture, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, and we want to promote that kind of thing and and grow it. So it's really encouraging to go to all these different shows and everybody that we meet is like that. Everyone we meet is, is a, someone you'd spend a deer camp, you know, yeah. like you'd, you'd spend deer camp with. Them. There's a lot of listeners we talked to where I was almost like, Hey man, we got this hunt coming up, you know, <laughs> but we're already maxed out. You know, we got so many, so many hunts and so many people well, at all these camps, you know, great example. When I was up in uh, Michigan and Kalamazoo for the, the Northern show for the mobile hunters expo, it was fascinating, like seeing a room full of killers. And like, I got to talk to Dan Infault quite a bit. He's actually on the podcast, so you're going to hear him on a future episode coming out uh, for a segment we record. I recorded with him. Um, but you, you start talking to all these different guys, and you know, we got listeners up there. We had some listeners come by the booth talk to me. They're from Michigan, and they're like, "Dude, of all the podcasts we listen to, even though you guys are like 12 hours away from us, like y'all's content directly." relates to how we hunt up here and like what we're finding success with which is pretty kind of cool or it was, it was pretty cool to kind of see that along with hearing them talk about even though again they're in a completely separate area of the country you know they're in the upper midwest area that they're able to take things from these southern guys and directly apply it up there and actually mm-hmm. have success killing deer yeah uh, and i told them and uh i know one guy's name is xavier oh my god what's the other guy's name <laughs> it's not devin Oh crap! I'm gonna mess the other guy's name up. Crap. Anyway, but both these guys, I told them, I'm like, when y'all kill a buck this year, and you, you know, you got a little listener success story, I want you to ride in because those are the ones I'm really excited about. Like guys that don't live in the southeast, that's supplying things that these guys yeah. in the southeast are actually using in killing deer, and it kind of shows that whether you know, and they're in an area, you know, they got some ag, but it's also some big wood stuff. Um, and they're just talking about like transition edges and that thick cover and how those bucks really like to use that to travel. And both of those guys are kind of later onset hunters. You know, they didn't grow up in a hunting family, anything like that. And they're kind of applying this stuff now and they're killing nice deer. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's, it's, dude, it's so fun. It's awesome. That feedback gets me so excited, but, um, also just like kind of going into like these different shows. It's interesting when you start talking to some of these different, uh, listeners and seeing what they find valuable coming out of certain episodes. You know, I, there was a couple guys that brought stuff up that like, I hadn't really thought about a whole bunch, like feedback wise, like one, one gentleman, um, at the world year expo that we interviewed on again, that was episode 500 talked about Tom Brownlee's episode, uh, episode fifth, uh, one, uh, three fifteen, like the truth about scent. Yep. Um, and talking about like how that changed his perspective on ground disturbance and his access routes and routes going in and out of like how he pinpoints, where's that quote unquote negative train that Josh driver talked about in episode 141, for him to be able to get out of a spot without hopefully having deer necessarily cross that path. Yeah. Um, and just how, like, it seems like he's, like, it's become more effective for him, like, where he can go back into areas and he's not getting busted and deer aren't necessarily, uh, mm-hmm. you know, winding him and his access routes coming in and out. Yeah. Um, which is just killer. Because, I mean, that's how, again, building that confidence of, like, you know, those clean in- entrance and exit routes – I feel like it gives you just more confidence when you get in the stand, like, oh, man, I got in here perfect. You know, if everything lines up right, the wind works out great, I should have opportunities. And it seemed like that guy, specifically in Alabama, started having opportunities when he started focusing on that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, but uh, on the flip side now, I know what, a little bit later in this episode, guys, we're going to get into some Q&As. And we've had some awesome Q&As get written in. Yeah, we got uh, them rolling now, baby. Rolling. You yeah. guys you guys are awesome. It started a little slow. I yep. was a little worried. Yep. You know, we got we got like one or two. I'm like, come on, send us questions. It'll be yep. fun, I promise. And, and, and now they're rolling, baby. There, there are some fantastic ones. And there's actually one that was, um, he, we didn't even write in on a Q&A, but he messaged us. And I want to answer it later on in this episode, talking about muzzleloader hunting um, and setups. Um, but... If you're interested in, again, writing us some questions that we can kind of cover on the podcast and give you a little shout out, you can actually go over. It should be a link down in the description below yep. uh, on the podcast, on the audio feed um, for listener success, uh, or not listener success story, listener Q&As. And it goes, goes to their website. There's you a link it, down there for success stories, too. And success stories. If you kill deer using what you've learned from the podcast, you can write that in as well, and we'll try to post that. Love getting those stories in. Uh, but the Q&As have been fantastic, but we're going to get to that a little bit later, but on the flip side, while I've been out traveling and going crazy and putting some serious miles on the truck, you've been out doing a little scouting, right? Yeah, yeah. So I wasn't able to make it to the uh, the Kalamazoo show, just a function of vacation time. Uh, 
and plane tickets being like six hundred dollars to get there that was crazy yeah um so uh yeah I, I was home this weekend and i took saturday morning i had some family stuff to do but saturday morning i had free so i asked my stepdad if he wanted to go scout mm-hmm. and uh we went out to our hunting club here next to the house that y'all have heard me talk about over the last couple of weeks, um, or I guess last year, because I was in it last year too. But I'm actually putting some time into it this year. Like I, I'm, I've last year I, I kind of bounced around and I hunted a little bit and just kind of got my feet wet with the property. Um, and then this year I'm kind of diving in a lot deeper and really picking the place apart. How, and it's been a lot of fun doing that. So I took him out, and he's got a ladder stand that he he bought for, for the house. Uh, so he's got 15 acres. A ladder that, or climber? He he got a climber. Okay. But he also has a ladder stand. Oh, okay. So he, bought, he, he lives on 15 acres, and he bought the ladder stand to put up. And he just kind of never put it up because the property really doesn't set up to hunt well at all. Mm-hmm. And so this ladder stand was laying around. I'm like, well, hey, let's go find a spot that has dynamite access. It'll be a good gun spot that we can hunt over and over again. And go put the ladder stand right there, mm-hmm. like on the club. So we loaded it up, went out to the club, and uh, went to go scout the actually the creek bottom where we tracked my doe. Yep. So uh, we got down there, and there was there was one spot in particular that I was really interested in looking at, and it is where there you got a pine thicket up on the hill. It's you know it's that point where you can't really hunt the pines anymore. Like they're they're too thick to bow hunt. Uh, they're too thick to gun hunt. Like you can't get up and see into them. These pines are like taller than me now. They're like 10, 15 foot pines, but they're still really thick underneath. Like they don't, they haven't gotten so big that they've shaded out all that good cover. Mm -hmm. So to me, they're like that perfect bedding age because you've got canopy cover that's giving them shade right now. Mm -hmm. So even right now they're going to be using it. Same thing in the fall. Uh, and nobody's going in it. Like Mm -hmm. nobody's going in it. You'll, you'll cut some beagles loose into it. It's the perfect like rabbit hunting thicket, you Mm -hmm. know? And that's on top of the hill, and then it goes down to the creek bottom, and then along the creek bottom, it's been cut over, basically. Mm-hmm. So um, you have, like, this buffer of cut over in between those those really thick pines, and then it's, like, anywhere from 50 to 200 yards of basically cut over, like, two-year-old cut over. It's all chest-high grass and, you know, all kinds of stuff. And then you've got your little skinny creek bottom. And... In those thick pines, there's a little bitty draw that comes out of them where there's just a couple mature trees that they left in it. And I love that kind of thing because, one, I feel like it's a landmark. Mm -hmm. When the deer are in that thicket, they can kind of follow the terrain and they hit those larger trees. And also, there's going to be like a a little bit of a a habitat break right there. Even though it's only just a couple trees, like that added shade and and everything around the base of those trees is going to create some kind of edge. And so it's just going to be different than the surrounding pines. Even if it's just really slightly different, it's still different. Mm-hmm. And so I find that they like to travel those. And I feel like also, especially bucks, like to walk those draws in thickets. I, like, I feel like they like to get low. And this kind of comes out of the thick pines, crosses the cutover, and then goes into the main creek bottom. And looking at it on the map, I'm like, that looks freaking good. Are you like, talking about the, like the, the draw that you were set up in when you shot that doe? No. Okay. No, nope, different draw. Okay, but anyway. Yeah. So no, this is even smaller than that. This Ooh. is this is literally coming out of the pine thicket. Okay. Like, uh, you're not on a creek or anything. And uh, we we found a tree that kind of overlooks it, and where this draw comes out, like you're looking down the hill, and the draw comes out and crosses that that cut over, and there's a tree line right there where they left the trees on it, and you you're basically just watching that. It's like a wall, and it's like a 150 yard shot or something. And we found the perfect tree. I'm like, this is great. You can slip down the Creek to get to it. I'm like, this will be perfect. You can get in the Creek and actually walk in the Creek or alongside it and be visually hidden. Your scent's going to be hidden and you can just pop right up and shoot up that ladder stand. It's super like very clean access coming mm-hmm. in the back door. And I'm like, this is where we need to put it, but let's walk down there and just check out this tree line and see what kind of sign we see. And we walked down there and actually, you remember when we were tracking my doe, and she actually went up into that little cutover area, mm-hmm. not on the flat side of the creek, but on the hillside. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was like some big scrapes right there. Yep. That's where you're watching Ooh. right there. Ooh, yeah. okay. So I didn't realize where we were until we popped out. And I was like, oh, I remember this. Mm-hmm. And you cannot, there's no trace of that scrape right now. Absolutely no trace. There's grass grown right there, but I'm like. No licking, you can't see the licking branch? There, you can see the licking branches, but they're not twisted or anything. Gotcha. Uh, but they're just, they're hanging there where they ought to be, you know, but they're not twisted up. And I was telling Mike, I'm like, there was a scrape here in November. Like, I distinctly remember, I marked it on my phone and everything. So that makes me feel pretty good. 
because it's almost like invisible sign a little bit. Like I know it, it was there. It'll be there this year for mm-hmm. sure. Uh, and then we, we kind of just walked the perimeter of that tree line and found a bunch more of those licking branches and some of them that were twisted up. And so I'm like, okay, that we're in really good shape. So we're going to go back in there and we're going to trim it just a little bit so we can get some more designated shooting lanes because that stuff is like chest high now. Mm-hmm. And I was explaining to Mike, I'm like, a deer is like way shorter than you think they are. Like a big buck doesn't come up to your hip. I mean, like they're pretty small, uh, like his his back. So if they're walking around in this stuff, you're going to see like chin up. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not going to see vitals on the deer at all. So we're just going to pick some little lanes and kind of lightly trim it so you can shoot into it a little bit easier and have designated lanes. What I, Like I was explaining to him, I'm like, we're going to put... One lane here, one lane here, and one lane here, and it's going to look like a turkey foot. And th- this is on the hunting club, by the way. Yeah, this is, so we can, like, trim and do whatever we want here. Um, and, and that way, I was explaining to Mike, I'm like, if if you're probably not going to see them come out of the thicket unless you're really watching that edge because you're only going to see, like, their head. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's a big buck, you'll probably see it because he's got big antlers on his head. But, like, a, if you're wanting to shoot a doe or something right there, if, if she comes out, you're probably not going to see her until she's in that first shooting lane, and she's probably going to cross it before you get a chance to shoot her. So we need multiple lanes. So by the time she crosses one, you're like, okay, here she comes. You get trained up on shooting lane number two, and you're ready by the time she steps into it. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we decided where we were going to do all that. And then while we were down there, I was like, well, let's just kind of start looking around at feed trees and stuff. I had my binos. It's uh, it's late summer, so it's time. You can you mm-hmm. can go out there and you can start seeing the feed trees and which ones produce, You know whether it's oaks or persimmons or just whatever mm-hmm. you're hunting. So uh, we go over to the other side of this little tree line, and here it's like a like a little small cutover is basically what it looks like. It's it's enclosed by tree lines. You got the creek bed, you've got the little bitty drainage that's got trees on it on one side, and then the thick pines, and it's like a triangle. Mm-hmm. So you got three edges, and it's like uh, I don't know, not very many acres. I mean, it's probably the size of like my yard out, like the 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 middle of the neighborhood over here, the little common area. Yeah, probably like a couple acres. Yeah, it's maybe. like a couple acres, like four acres or something like that. And uh, it's all that, that same kind of thick cutover stuff. Looks great. A lot of tracks in it right now. Mm-hmm. A lot of browse pressure in it. There's pokeweed in there, or poke salad, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. that is just, it's like a big fat stalk, like bigger than your thumb, and it's like almost browse to the ground. Oh, I, wow. I was telling Mike, I'm like, this bush was probably like this big. Yeah. And they have literally eaten it to the ground. That's cool. And, uh, I'm, uh, we're out there and I'm kind of scanning the tree line with my binos looking and I see this big water oak on the edge. I'm like, man, if that water oak made this year, it's going to be freaking perfect. And we walked over there and glassed into that thing and I have never seen so many acorns on a tree ever. Wow. Dude, like never. How, how big is the tree at the base? It's, like this big. It's huge. Yeah. It's giant. Yeah. Well, you look up there and it's like clusters. Like one limb has hundreds of acorns on it. Yeah. Like you didn't even need the binos. I was like, just, I handed the binos to Mike. I was like, just look, you'll see them. And like literally just like huge clumps of them just all over the freaking tree, dude. Mm. I was like, mm. marking this. Mm. We're marking this spot. Got chills. And so the, the other good thing is there's already like so many tracks underneath it mm-hmm. where they're just crossing right there. Mm-hmm. So they're naturally coming out of that pine thicket and crossing underneath that tree. And I was like, this is perfect because they, they already want to pass through here. They're already using this area. Mm-hmm. And at some point, this tree is going to start dropping, and that's just going to, like, hold them here. How, it, how far know. is that from a stand location? From the ladder stand? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's it's not. It's like 250 yards, but there's a tree line in the way. So this is not a ladder stand spot. Gotcha. This is a bow spot. I was telling Mike. Um, this is totally a spot where you should go, like, October 15th and see if it's dropping or just mid October and check it and see what's going on. Um, we're going to go in there and prep it a little bit too. So we find that one and there's another one next to it. That's got some, but not near as many. I mean, it's like another water oak. Yeah. Another water oak. I mean, just clump. I mean, dude, so many, it's going to be crazy when that thing starts dropping. Which water oaks, uh, this actually came up when I was at the Northern show because we were talking about water oaks, people that didn't understand what it was. Yeah. They produce like these tiny little acorns. Like, yeah, they're they're super small. Um, they're really good for wood ducks. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, for sure. But again, it, typically you're going to find them water. You're going to find them in these low lying areas where mm-hmm. you're going to have whether it's flooding or just super super moist ground. Um, so um, and that's kind of weird because you you only find them in certain pockets. Like if you go to yeah. an area where like you get any kind of elevation, like I've never I don't think I've ever found one high up on some kind of ridge unless it was like in a drainage. Higher High up, up on a ridge. yeah, it's got to be like some kind of low spot where there's yeah. water actually coming through that area, mm-hmm. typically. Yeah, but 
anyway, but spe- specifically with water oaks, like guys like Scott Seals talk about, that's like one of the best trees. Other yeah. Like a white oak is like that yeah. water. You find a hot water oak is like they are going to be on it. And also, typically, you now like you can find some smaller ones, but typically when you find them, these trees are, you're talking hundreds of years old. And there's so much on them if they're going to drop like the one you're talking about. It could drop for who knows how long. Oh, it, they, 30 plus days, 40 days. We, we've hunted them in January. Yeah. We've killed deer on them in January. And, and, and like down at the family farm, there's a, there is a water down there that is, I would love to know that that, that trees legitimately pr- might have been here since like the settling of the United States. You need, okay? to, you need to get a little increment bore well, to figure well, it out. Uh, well, with it, it produces so much there. And like Anthony, they, he shot some he shot some bucks underneath it, but it's down in one of the food plots down low in elevation. But it is a, I mean, four or five guys might not be able to get their arms around the tree. Yeah. Um. But it is it is it's such a heavy producer that like you know, deer just hammer that tree and they feed on it for such a long period of time, which mm-hmm. is pretty interesting. Now, yeah. did you find any white oaks while y'all were down there? Yeah. So there are some white oaks. Um. Which, by the way, on a water oak too, like for people who aren't familiar with them, they also hold their leaves pretty mm-hmm. long into the year so it's like they're they're not it'll be january and they'll still have leaves on them mm-hmm. uh and and i don't know if they just they release all their mass like very slowly and that's why they stay good or if or if the the acorn on the ground like stays good for longer because mm-hmm. like a white oak when it hits the ground it doesn't stay good for that long i don't think yeah um but those water oaks do and yeah they're an excellent food source especially getting into like december and january mm-hmm. here like they really light up um there was a few. There were some uh, chestnut oaks in there, mm-hmm. and there were some American white oaks. And those are they're different. I like. I've always seen the deer not seem to really like those chestnut oaks very much, and the American white oak is the white oak everyone thinks of. There were some of those, but we didn't find any that really produced that great. Oh, really? So I don't know if it was that I just couldn't see because it's such a bigger leaf. That's another thing with the water oaks. It's really easy to see the acorns on them because even though they're small, there's a there's a ton of them. Yeah. And but the leaves are really small, so it's mm-hmm. like a very small little spatulate leaf on it, mm-hmm. and so you can see through the canopy a lot better. With a white oak, you're talking a leaf like that big, and there's a bunch of them, so they can kind of really hide what's actually in that tree. Because I have checked trees in the past, uh, white oaks. Where I check it and I just cannot see any acorns at all, and I think that it's it hasn't produced. And then I go back in there in October when a couple, maybe some leaves have started dropping, but the acorns are like full size and they're huge. And then you're like, where were all these like a month ago? Yeah, like and they're just there all of a sudden. Hmm. So I did find a couple where I could see a, a few acorns like way up in the tree, and so I'm like, okay, we need to mark these and come back to them later this fall and see if they're actually dropping. But uh, a lot of the white oaks on that are kind of closer into the creek and one thing that we noticed when we were looking at these feed trees is that the feed trees on the edges of the opening so on the edges of the cutovers they produced a lot better than the than the trees on the interior of the smz gotcha and i was telling mike about it It, i think it has to do with competition between the trees because the ones that are by themselves so there's another water oak that was actually in the interior was growing right on the edge of the creek Mm -hmm. um there was not another big tree around it for a good 30 yards so if you look at it there's saplings and stuff around it but there's not another like large mature tree within like 30 yards and it it produced a ton not quite as many as the first one but close i mean it it produced really good but then the ones that you found that had you know some other mature trees you know pretty close to them none of those produced as well and so i was telling mike i'm like anytime i see one of these bigger ones out by itself i want to go check it because there's a better chance it produced in my opinion Mm mm-hmm and uh, so we found a couple of those, along with some persimmons that produced that, you know, maybe we'll put cameras at. But as we were walking away from that first big water oak that we found, the one that was really loaded up, I found a monster track, dude. I found a big, big, big track. The biggest track I found on the club. And I didn't just find one of his tracks. I found his track line going through the woods because this area flooded out really bad last year. And so when you get in that SMZ, a lot of it's dirt. Like a, a whole bunch of it is just bare dirt or like kind of little muddy patches, and so you ha- it's like the perfect place to go find tracks because there's just there's deer tracks mm. all over this bottom, and yeah, I found I found a big one. I'll cut it into the YouTube video. <laughs> how, how big are we talking? Straight up, 
I mean, four fingers all day, dude. You just set your hand down in that sucker. Running track? No, walking track. See, Andrew gives me crap because I'd find these tracks decent, but he's like, man, it's a running track, man. You don't. Well, because you find running tracks, no, bro. Oh, my God. Yes, you do. Dude, Jeremy Aaron, listen, I've had a detailed conversation with him on the podcast and off the podcast. It, it has to, you have to look at multiple things. Uh -huh. You have to look at the stride of the deer. That uh -huh. When you're trying to determine whether or not it's a running track, you got to look at the stride of the deer because Correct. they can splay out really big. With they're walking and they're heavy and they're on the right kind of dirt, you know, a buck walking, putting his foot down, it could splay out just because he's so heavy, but it's got to be the right kind of dirt. A doe running can make the same track pretty much, but it's just because she's running and she's hitting the ground harder and her foot is just kind of stretching out when she's hitting the ground. Well, a lot of that's also the length of the hoof too, because like you, you're right. If you see like a, uh, and the one I, I remember actually, I think I do remember seeing that on the story, and like you can tell it's a longer track too. It's not just you know, two and a half inches long and yeah. it's, you know, four inches wide. Um, but yeah, I mean, for sure. But no, Andrew's always giving me crap about oh, finding, yeah. finding running tracks. And Jeremy Aaron, me and him, he's like, man, more people think they're finding running tracks than what they actually are. It's like, you find a big mature buck and it's a 12 to 16 inch, you know, stride length. He's not running at that point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but, exactly. But anyways. Well, that's why it's also helpful. You got to find like a line of tracks where, mm -hmm. you, where you have a couple sets, you know, going where you can see, not just like where he stepped in the ditch on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. Like those are, I think those are notoriously misleading. Like if, if you've got one track on the mm -hmm. side of the road and the soft dirt on the side of the road, yeah, like clay or something. Yeah. That doesn't really tell you much. Yep. Like at least you can't confirm much off of it, but yeah, this one, and you're always giving me crap because I'm like, Oh, that's a good track. And you're like, what good track? Like that's nothing. This I will admit Andrew, this is a this is a good refresher in what a four finger track that's what actually I'm, that's is. That's what I'm saying. Like Andrew gets excited about these tracks. I'm like that doesn't get me excited about. Like it's yeah. it's a little track. But then again, we've hunted areas in Alabama where the deer are so small body wise. Like where they, we shot the two bucks, they had tiny little hooves. Well, and when we killed them, the first thing we did was look at their hooves and we're like, yeah, these are small. They looked like a freaking like a two year old doe's <laughs> hoof. Like, they're yeah. tiny, and yeah. I'm like, okay, well you got to take that in consideration where you're at. I mean, if you're in an area with super small body deer, you're not going to get a three and a half or four finger wide track yeah you know they're going to be two and a half finger widths or you know maybe a three finger width track yeah this was this was a track i i could take my four fingers like that and just set it right down in the track and not touch the edges of it like mm -hmm. i just I had room on both sides of my hand mm -hmm. and i was like i was telling mike i'm like this this is what we're you, you go hunt eye with me Oh, and I know. a doe's track's that big, and yeah. you see a buck's track, and you're like, I can't comprehend this. <laughs> an 18-finger track. <laughs> so so that was exciting because that was the first, uh, like, confirmed, like, big big buck sign that we found, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Like, like that's probably going to be a really nice buck, an mm -hmm. older buck that left that track. We got some cameras on a bunch of creek crossings, and we're getting some bucks crossing. Like, some bucks that, that I'm not necessarily interested in shooting— couple like i think we got one like decent eight point you know just kind of basket eight and a couple six points that are just you know right at the ears uh, like pretty common bucks for this area perfect deer for for mike because like mike he's still trying to get his first deer he's Brand like new. i don't care what it is like he's 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 gonna shoot whatever walks out that's mm -hmm. legal this year and and good for him that's what he should do yeah but i told him i'm like this is what this is what we're really looking for by the way uh, with the y'all didn't actually put the ladder stamp. You just found the tree, right? Yeah, we had it with us, but we didn't put it out. So I had to I had to go to the, North Alabama. The for question a family thing. the question is: Does that tree that you selected does it have enough cover for a ladder stand? Because ladder stands are notorious about putting people putting them on wide open trees with zero cover on them, and maybe you have like some leaf you know backdrop to you. But when the leaves come down, you're exposed. So like, mm -hmm. does it have? I'm guessing it's not a tall ladder stand. If I had to guess. It's pretty tall. I don't know how many feet it is, but it's not like you're, you know, you find like a 12-foot ladder stand. Okay. I, I think it's taller than that, but I haven't actually put it on a tree Be yet. Because, like, with ladder stands, especially because he's such a new hunter, like, he's got a climber and stuff, but, like, you know, you're looking at trying to find something for him that's easier and more comfortable to kind of get up in and stuff like that, yep. just to kind of get used to being elevated. Um it's like if if that's the case, like especially if it's a tree with not a lot of cover, I'd be going to cut some cedars down and zip time to the back side of that stand and mm -hmm. almost making it like a dance like a blind, like literally coming around. Does it have a shooting rail on it? Yeah. So that's what we're actually gonna do. The the tree that it we're gonna put it on, there's actually two or three trees there and we're trying to figure out which one would be the best. But I think the winner it's it's right on the edge. Which is not but always. it's it's like a four trunked uh okay. uh red maple. Okay. And there's decent back cover, and the the four trunks are going to hide you a little bit, but there's nothing in front of you at all. Yeah. So I was telling him, like, we're probably going to have to cut stuff and build a little blind right here 
like around this thing just to conceal your movement or whatever. And see, that's what that's that's a huge mistake a lot of people make. Whether it's it doesn't even have to be with a ladder stand; it could be with a climber or even with a saddle. Well, a saddle's a little bit different because you're on the backside of the tree. But if you get right on that edge, whether it's a field edge, whether it's a edge of a clear cut, if you're not crazy high, I mean, you're going to be especially if it's in a hill country where the deer can come out almost eye level mm-hmm. with you if they're like 20, 30 feet above you. Um, you know, up the ridge line, you know, you are so exposed in that situation versus trying to get one tree off you know, that opening. Yeah. So like in that case, I mean, you're going to have to have, I mean, I'd go, there's a lot of cedars in that place and timber company won't care if you cut a cedar down. I'd cut some cedars down and put some behind them. Like if it's four trunks, that's awesome. Cause you get stuff you can strap it to. Oh some yeah. Some really giant, some big zip ties, put two or three big zip ties together. Yeah. And strap it to the tree and then also put something on the front side too. Just so like when you get up there, you're slightly more concealed, but also mm-hmm. there's no way to get out of that stand very easily without getting, if there's a deer out there, like, listen, like an episode's going to come out in a couple weeks. Oh now. yeah. Yeah. Mike, there's a deer there. You're not climbing down dude. to the deer's <laughs> gone. I don't care how dark it gets. Yep. Like, don't pull an Andrew Maxwell so I can get his dark running out of the tree. <laughs> I mean, Forget, getting out of there. You're going to have to be a little more patient in that spot, but, yeah. but that's cool though. Yeah, no, it's going to be a good spot. And uh, another good thing about it is where the deer are likely going to be coming out is that you're kind of sitting on top of a hill in this spot. So you're like, I don't know how many feet, 15, 20 feet higher than the bottom where they're most likely going to be crossing. Gotcha. So the hill comes up and then you're getting on a tree on top of that hill. So when it's all said and done, you'll be decently elevated above them. But yeah, you're definitely right. You need more cover. That's a video we need to do. We need to go do a video about how to brush in that ladder stand. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I told him, I'm like, we'll come out here and like really take our time with it and just make sure we're set up right. Because what I told him is like the number one thing with this ladder stand, it might not even go in like quote unquote the best spot. Mm-hmm. I just want it in a spot where you can go back and hunt it very consistently and not screw up the spot. Like access is my main concern for this because I'm like, if we're going to go through all this trouble and cut shooting lanes and do whatever and hang this giant heavy thing up, then we need to be able to come back and hunt it consistently and not burn it after three hunts, you know, cause I, I was explaining to him, there's going to be spots that we hunt this year that you don't go in and hunt over and over and over and over again. Like you kind of save them for when it's going to be better. And this one, I, I would like for it to be in a spot that you can, like if you want to go shoot a doe, go shoot a doe, or just a really good rut spot that you can hunt. Because Mike's talking about taking some time off work to hunt this property. I'm like, well, we need to find you some spots that like maybe around New Year's when the rut's coming in, early January, you can take off, you can use three or four vacation days and loop them in with your holidays Mm -hmm. and you can get like seven days free Mm -hmm. and you can just go and stay out there. I'm like, if you do that, you're probably, I'm not going to say you're going to kill something because you might miss, but you're going to get a crack at something, Yeah, you know, because there comes a point where day three, day four, you're no longer guessing or you're no longer trying to figure out where the deer are at. You found out where they're at and now you're just going in to kill them. You know, and that's why you, that's why a lot of times you have success on those longer trips mm-hmm. and you're not having success on the weekends because you're starting over every weekend. You're guessing at where they're at. And on those longer trips, day one, day two, you're kind of getting a feel for things like what's going on, where are they at, what are they feeding on. And then day three on, you should be like on them. You now, know? now, a little devil's advocate with this spot because I kind of know the side of the creek's on. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to have some kind of westerly wind to hunt that, right? Let me think of how this sets up. Uh, yeah. Oh, it, really? Any kind of south wind for that spot? Even a southeast? Yeah. Wouldn't it blow you back into that cut? No, I don't think so. And also the thermals, because you're up on top of that little rise. How its thermals going to play a factor? Like, does that ridge point keep dropping off right behind the stand location? Yeah. So the it comes up. You got the creek down there, mm-hmm. and the the hill comes up pretty steep, and right on top of that steep hill is where that tree is at. Gotcha. And then the creek is flowing down. Um, really, I think it would be a better morning spot than evening spot just because of the thermals mm-hmm. because you're facing downstream. Yeah. Um, so, like, that's going to cause some issues because I'm like, y- the deer might come out of this pine thicket, but they also might come from the other direction mm-hmm. and be going into that pine thicket. So that's just something you kind of have to be mindful of uh, in this area. So, like, a good, a nice southern breeze would will help a lot for sure. Um, especially just with how this area sets up and where the open terrain is. A southern breeze is probably going to be a little bit stronger, uh, like relative to what the mile per hour is, because, you know, if you have a, like a, like a six, seven mile per hour breeze, but you have a a ridge covered with pine trees, you know, in front of you, Mm -hmm. like that's going to break that wind a lot and it's not going to be that strong. This one, that wind is going to channel down that valley pretty well, Mm -hmm. especially coming off the lake. 
because uh, this this club adjoins a lake, and that that wind's going to come off that lake, and I think it's going to stay pretty strong. So if you get like a six mile per hour southern wind, it should be a pretty steady breeze because there's not a ton of stuff in front of you that's going to like screw that up. You know, mm-hmm. it's uh it's not going to hit trees and start eddying and swirling off of stuff. It it should channel down that opening pretty well but But that's something you can't really predict you have to go in there and just hunt it and see how it does now if you get that perfect cold front that hits and you get that north northwest wind coming is it even huntable in that situation from axis let me look i don't know (laughs) i'm putting you on the spot listen now he found this spot thinking about talking about january you know i mean we get a lot of southern uh, winds we we do but if you get that perfect freaking cold front pushing through gosh man that's the uh that's the ticket North, get the, yeah, the, northwest would not be ideal. See where where are you at? You are right here. Oh, you definitely watching that way. Yeah, definitely not hunting it with any north wind. Yeah, well, no, you could hunt it with a northeast wind for sure. Northeast coming down, yeah, that would be fine. That'd be a, that'd be a killing wind actually. That would be a killing wind. Yeah, northeast might be the best one actually. So yeah, I don't know, dude. I don't know. So uh, that's another reason we actually didn't put it out though, because there's two or three other locations that we want to go look at. Mm-hmm. And just confirm that this is a good spot. Even if the ladder stand doesn't go there, I think it's going to be a really good spot anyway. It's like, mm-hmm. I'm going to hunt it for sure. Um, but there might be some better spots. Like, we just want to figure out, like, what what is the goal with the ladder stand? Like, are you looking to go and, like, hammer a doe every other Saturday on this ladder stand? Or, like, what, what do you want to do with it? Because it's his stand, and I would really just want him to, like, have success out there this year. Yeah. Um, but we're starting on the right foot with that place. You know, we... We had been focusing on this one area where all of our cameras are at. We're getting some decent deer on camera. I suspect there's bigger deer in the area that we're just not seeing right now. But I told Mike, I'm like, we kind of scouted it. I think there's bigger deer than we're getting on camera there. So don't be too discouraged by the cameras. But let's let's start branching out and finding some other places that we're going to be able to bounce around to. Yep. And just see what we can locate. Um, so, yeah, very excited about that. Very excited about that area. Especially the, the water oak. I think it's going to be a... Uh, I, money I, I'll tell you the spot. If I was going to go hunt that club, and I wanted to kill a big deer, it'd be over the Bella Railroad track, that in that northeast corner of the property. Oh yeah, they, up there in the marsh and everything. Yeah, they thin those pines too. You know, <sighs> it'd be that's it, dude. <laughs> that's it. I'm telling you, man. You get like that marsh and like I don't. It's not rhododendron. What's that green stuff growing down in there? It looked like kind of like mountain lorem. We walked through that when you first got in that club. Oh yeah, I don't know. It's it kind of looked like I have to go look at it. Look kind of like Mountain Laurel, but it's not Mountain Laurel. Um, yeah. But anyways, that did that spot. If I, Big Buck trying to push the doe away from some bucks, he's going down that crap mm. with her, or she's oh, getting away yeah. from her right there. Oh my gosh, it'd be unreal. But um, all right, so to kind of wrap up that segment, I want to kind of get over uh, and doing some Q and A. So we got some really good Q and As. One I want to kind of answer right off the top. Uh, there's a guy that messaged us. Uh, I, I need to find the message real quick. Um, and he was just asking about uh, muzzle loading setups. Uh, let's see here. Ch-ch-ch-ch-ch. Uh, no, let's see here. Is it this is the last one we did, right? Yeah, yeah, we did. Yep, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, while you're looking for that, I will go ahead and do the first one from the website. Um, this is from Jeff Colney, um, or Colby. I think he misspelled it. Jeff, yeah, Jeff Colby. Uh, Please share what terms like SMZ yep. each episode uh, when you say it. I've listened to a few of your podcasts and heard the term, but don't know what it is. We just said we just had two messages coming in as well from two different guys about the exact same thing. Really? Yeah. Man, I feel like we, we talk about SMZ. I, like, I know, but you, we talk about, but you don't ever explain it. And I try to do it every episode. I was going to bring it up to you earlier today. So, what is yep. a stream side management zone or an yep. SMZ? Man, we got to do like a mapping thing on the net mapping terminology on the YouTube yep. channel. Go subscribe to the YouTube because we are planning on doing that. Uh, SMZ, Streamside Management Zone, it is where when they come in and they, they're cutting over an area, they're cutting all the trees out of it, they leave a buffer of trees around a stream. So it could be like a big creek. Sometimes it's just a little dry branch or something, but they, they leave a buffer of, of woods right there, basically. And most of the time, that's hardwoods yep. because that's what originally was there is like kind of mixed hardwood forest naturally. And, uh, and so that's why you have your hardwoods in those lower stream area so smz streamside management zone hardwood bottom like that those all kind of mean the same your drainages your draws any Mm -hmm. of those low spots that they're not coming they're not cutting all the way across so they're leaving that buffer there and it's a great habitat edge and especially down here 
in the southeast, deep southeast, especially in areas where, um, you know, whether it's public land or private land, you're hunting on timber company property, where like our number one ag culture down here where we're at is is pine trees and timber. Um, you know, they're clear cutting the tops, they're replanting the tops of these ridges, but they're leaving all those hardwood draws and those drainages, those creek drainages, which is the term is SMZ stream side management zone. Yep. Um, and just awesome stuff. But yeah, we talked about that nearly in every episode, but we had a couple messages come in. I, yeah. I, I want to read off. This is a Q and a that was actually a message to us. We typically don't want to do this. We really want you guys to submit them on the website, which again, the links down in the show notes of the podcast, you can click it and link there. This is a guy, he reached out to me and uh, reached out to us as well. Name's Hunter Adams. And uh, he said, hey, brother, uh, I've been following the podcast uh, since it started. You've had tremendous success in muzzleloading. I was wondering what you use for your ammunition and ch- uh, powder charge. I've lost more deer and hogs to a muzzleloader than I care to admit over the past couple of years, but I'm looking forward to changing that. So uh, what he was talking about with that, the last few years, uh, I've just, uh, I've had, again, a decent, pretty good success hunting with a muzzleloader. I feel extremely confident with my muzzleloader. Um, and I've had actually quite a few guys ask about this because a lot of guys, they look at hunting with a muzzleloader and talking to inline muzzleloader, not talking flint lock or anything like that, inline muzzleloaders. Um, a lot of people just are not confident in their setups. And I think the reasoning why is since in the Southeast, there's some states that have a lot longer muzzleloader season than others. Alabama has a very short muzzleloader season that's, I think, like five days long. It's and not it's, even, it's and like, it's Monday through Friday. Yeah, it's not even seven days. It's, just, it's like a slight buffer in between muzzleloading or in between bow season and rifle season. Look, and I just want to take the opportunity to bring up last time we interviewed Chuck Sykes, the director of Wildlife and Freshwater Fisheries in Alabama. I think this is off the record, wasn't it? Yeah, like, it was. So it was after we got done recording. But Jacob brought that up because we on the way down there. He's like, man, I got. I want to ask him about our muzzleloader season. Like, we just don't get enough muzzleloader time. And Jacob goes on this whole tear. You know, salesman Jacob's over yeah. here, and he's like, well, we should have a longer muzzle. Blah, blah 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 blah. You start talking about it, and then like Chuck's just sitting there looking at you, and he's like, you can gun hunt for two months. <laughs> it was just like valid. Oh, dude, the look on your face after that, you were like, I didn't think about it that way. <laughs> valid, valid point. Oh, that was so funny. But um. So with muzzler hunting, uh, a, a, a lot of guys, I, I've heard this a lot from a lot of people where like, they're just, they don't have a lot of success with it. Like that they're worried about, they're not getting great penetration or they're just having issues losing deer. And the first thing I always tell anybody, whether it's, you know, it's bow hunting, it's, you know, hunting with a muzzler or hunting with a rifle is in all honesty, first off, how good of a shot are you and, and how worked up do you get in situations? Because you can have the most accurate gun in the world but if you can't, if you don't have a really good trigger pull, or you could have, you know, you could have your bow completely dialed in, but if you get buck fever too bad, you're you're gonna mess up that opportunity. So that's number one. Like truly, like how much do you practice and how good of a shot you are, how comfortable you are you with that weapon? Number two, in my personal thought and opinion, with muzzle loaders, especially inline muzzle loaders, I've, I shoot a CVA Acura. Uh, I've had it now for a few years now. It's an extremely accurate gun that I've been using. Uh, used to have a CVA Optima and just got an Acura probably four years ago. But first off most guys want the absolute highest velocity they can get in a muzzler. So they shoot a max powder charge, which in some of the CVAs is 150 grains of black powder, uh, whether you're using triple seven or if you're using Blackhorn 209, which I've got some, but I don't use that powder all that much. You're not necessarily, you're not shooting 150 grains of that because it's just a little bit hotter powder. But most guys want the highest velocity possible, so they try to shoot the lightest bullet with the most powder which doesn't typically work very great with muzzlers in my experience. Uh, those bullets are designed to shoot at a pretty low velocity. And if you hit a deer extremely close to you, especially with those, one of those lighter bullets, like if you shoot a deer within 60, 80 yards of you with a really light bullet, like a 200, like if you're shooting a 50 caliber bullet or 50 caliber uh, muzzleloader, if that bullet is in the 225 to even almost up to the 275 range, I've heard a lot of people losing deer with that just because they just nearly explode on contact uh, or on impact uh, if they're shooting a max powder uh, charge. It's kind of like the way I look at the muzzleloader is kind of similar to how a lot of guys are looking at the archery setup with a whole FOC and heavy arrow stuff. I truly believe that with a muzzleloader. Like, I think you should shoot like nearly the heaviest bullet you can find at that range. It's going to expand um, and not necessarily worry about shooting the fastest uh, bullet possible. Uh, so I've started doing this a few years back and first off, my gun started shooting a lot better with that heavier bullet, a lot more consistent, uh, again, nearly clover leafing at a hundred yards with my gun, uh, and also not worrying about shooting a max powder charge. Um, and I haven't chronographed my muzzleloader, but if I had to guess, it's probably shooting in that, that 1500 feet per second range. Mm-hmm. And some guys are shooting 
powder charges they're getting up to 2,000 feet per second yeah um and especially if you're shooting like a paramount like a cva paramount uh which can shoot like 2200 feet per second that's a completely different animal most guys aren't shooting that gun specifically most guys are shooting like a you know you're shooting maybe a a, a, a knight's muzzleloader a, a thompson center or a cva something like that and that 100 to 110 grains of powder is a pretty good load for a lot of those. But what I've done is I shoot loose powder, number one, because I weigh out all my powder charges. I want it exactly the same every single time. So I've got a small scale. I weigh out. It's 100. And by volume, it's 110 uh, grains of powder is what like my specific load in my gun shoots absolutely the best. I've shot higher than that. And it like, yeah, you're going at higher velocity, but it's not nearly as tight of a group as I can get with 110 grains of powder. Um, and then also I shoot the heaviest bullet I can get, get a hold of, which the heaviest one I've shot and had success with is the uh, power belt ELRs. And it's a 330 grain, 50 caliber uh, projectile bullet. And it hit, I, the way I explained it to people, it shoots really good. I can shoot out to two, I feel comfortable out to 225 yards with that gun. Um, it, it doesn't drop crazy much at that distance. Like at 200 yards when I've shot uh, at range, it's dropping right around six inches or so with a hundred yard zero at 200 yards, dropping about six inches. Um, but when it hits, it hits like a absolute freight train. Like when you hit that deer, it sounds like you're slapping a two by four up against a tree as hard as you can. Um, and I've had tremendous success, not only on penetration with that, with that projectile, uh, but also just with overall downrange performance. Um, uh, and like both that deer I've shot in Iowa, uh, both of those deer have dropped both of those deer with that muzzleloader. Uh, one was at 110 yards and the other one was at 189 yards with that muzzleloader. Um, shot a few deer last year in Arkansas with it. Complete pass throughs on those deer. They were within 45 yards, complete pass through. And the whole of that bullet, because when it, it mushrooms and it's got like that, 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 uh, lead core base on it, that just punches right through it puts a freaking huge hole through that deer, uh, which is, again, a, a huge aspect that I'm looking for. I don't want a small little bolt hole going through with that 50 caliber projectile. Um, and I haven't had, knock on wood, haven't had a deer run probably more than 45 yards with that. Also killed a bear with a muzzleloader as well. Um, and it's just been extremely successful for me. But again, try and shoot a heavier projectile bullet. Or if you're going to shoot lightweight, don't shoot a lightweight lead bullet. If you're going to shoot lightweight, use a copper bullet. Um, some guys will shoot, there's a couple different companies out there. I haven't had experience with the power belts, but there's a couple other brands out there that make an actual copper bullet, uh, that when it opens up, it's almost like a broadhead. Like, yeah, it has that impact like a bullet does, but those, the, the, um, they call them, um, uh, not panels. Um, gosh, the, uh, when the bullet, the pedals, the right? pedals, yeah. When it opens up, it's almost like the pedals open up like this at my hand, and it just cuts a huge hole going through that deer. And they have really good penetration. So if you're gonna go lightweight, if you're gonna go under, in my opinion, under like 275 grains, I would shoot a copper bullet. If you're gonna, if you want to shoot lead, I would go over the 275 grains, specifically with a muzzleloader. Um, and again, I've had tremendous penetration going through shoulder blades, all that kind of stuff. I haven't had any, any, I haven't had any bad results as in bullet performance uh, out to 189 yards on, on wild game. And like with those Iowa deer, they're big body deer. Um, and it had nearly uh, full penetration on those deer. Like the one in, uh, the, the last two in Iowa broke through the front shoulder. Both of them broke through the front shoulder and got lodged in the hide on the offside shoulder. Went through the offside shoulder and it was lodged in the offside hide, uh, which is fantastic performance with a muzzleloader at that range. So, um, I just, I recommend that. And a lot of guys like shooting the powder, um, the, the pellets, the powder pellets, like triple seven, uh, powder pellets. That's fine. I always don't trust them though. Cause I'm always worried that like, for whatever reason, it's going to be a couple grains off, which is going to perfect your downrange accuracy and precision with that gun. So that's why I personally like shooting loose powder plus loose powder for the money. You get way more for your money than you do with the pellet, with the pellets, like the pellets, the powder, like triple seven is nearly the same price, but I can get probably i haven't measured out probably a hundred shots out of, out of one canister of triple seven where in the um in the little uh pellet boxes you might get 25 or 30 shots out of that for the nearly the same price so um, at the at the risk of going down rabbit hole here i, I want to bring this up because you talked a little bit about bullet performance there mm -hmm. especially at closer ranges um and i'm not i'm not like as into the ballistics and everything like as you are and you know a lot more about this than i do um I used to shoot a uh, seven mag, you know, and back, back when I was shooting that seven mag a lot, I was shooting a Nosler partition, mm -hmm. which is a, a good bullet. Like a lot of people swear by that bullet, but I had three or four bad experiences in a row, specifically shooting at closer ranges 
uh, with that bullet where, you know, I'm not necessarily trying to kill a deer at 20 yards with a 7 mag, but it happened like four mm-hmm. times in a row. And on all of them, the bullet did not perform well. Like it fragmented out really bad, uh, didn't exit, you know, just like did not do what I wanted it to do. I killed the deer, but it's like I got a pinhole on one side and I've got a shredded bullet that just kind of went all over the place and no exit hole. And the deer ran a long ways before it died. Yeah. You know, lethal shot, but obviously not what you exactly want. Um, ended up switching to the uh, Hornady LDX, which is just an absolute opposite. I mean, just like devastating, mm-hmm. huge blood. Tr- like, could not be more impressed with that bullet. Why? Why is it? That, do you think that 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 uh, that nozzle partition is like not doing great? at closer range, especially out of a 7 mag where you're shooting something like very hot, like magnum round. A lot of times, I'm not exactly familiar. I, I mean, I'm familiar with the partition, but I haven't been familiar with the, the bolt makeup. And I've talked to the some of the developers and designers at Hornady uh, before about this. A lot of times, what's passing through, if you get a pass-through shot with a rifle, it's not the front half of the bullet. As that bullet's going through, it's shedding that front half of that bullet. It's shedding that lead and that copper jacket as it's going through. And what's actually passing through is the base of that bullet. Yeah. So that would that I, I would wonder is the partition does it have a softer base going down into it because those ELDXs has a very stiff stout uh, uh, both copper and, and lead base so a lot of times that's what's punching through the actual mm-hmm. bullet itself and actually I've got a um, from my uh, velvet deer from a couple of years ago I actually still have that bullet uh, at my place where you can see it I didn't get I mean that was two hundred and eighty nine yards I shot it with I shot it at. And they get a pass through, but it was lodged in the offside shoulder, uh, outside, like just on the underside of the hide, and it performed flawless. Where it's it's mushrooming opening, but that 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 the base of that bullet is what's driving it through. Yeah. Um. And a lot of times, again, some people will shoot like a. It it, it really just depends. Like I've shot lighter bullets. Like Hornady has a uh, which I don't shoot these anymore. It's the SSTs, Hornady mm-hmm. SSTs, and they're in their. If you buy the actual factory ammunition, it's in their. Um, Superformance line, and their whole thing is they use a different powder charge in there where it gives you that extra 100 to 200 feet per second faster out of another factory load. But that I don't really like that bullet because that bullet does exactly what you're talking about. It is like a hand grenade going off. It's it's a very thin jacket bullet, cup and core design bullet, so it's got a big lead uh, core inside of it. In the base of it, like the actual base of the bullet, like the flat base of that bullet is a lot smaller, as in the thickness of it. Uh, from like you know vertical from the very bottom of the bullet up to that lead core compared to like the ELDXs. Yeah. Um. So I've shot deer with that again at close range and there's no exit hole. I never lost a deer, but when you go to gut the deer, everything is just like ruptured oh, because it's yeah. like it's it's dropping a, a serious shock wave going through that animal and it's like being a frag grenade. Mm-hmm. Um. Which some people like that. Everybody likes bullets slightly different. Some people like that performance where others want that exit hole coming out the mm-hmm. other side. So, like, it, it comes down to, like, what are you looking for? Like, if I'm hunting, like, a bigger animal, I want the most penetration possible. Yeah. If you're hunting a 140-pound whitetail in Alabama, you might not need that. You might just want it to kind of rupture on the inside. But the problem is when you have those super soft bullets like that is when you take a frontal shot. You take a brisket hit shot. Yeah. And it literally, there there could there could be, especially if you start shooting, like, a 243, like a smaller diamond bullet, a lighter weight bullet, you could have the situation, you shoot a big mature buck, frontal shot at 60 yards, you might not get great enough penetration to put that deer down extremely quickly. Yeah. And that's where I hear about a lot of guys losing deer. Even like a 300 wind mag, they take a frontal shot. They don't have the right bullet design to be able to do that effectively. And then next thing you know, they blew a huge hole in the in the brisket, but a lot of it didn't get penetration through to be able to take out the heart or take out part of the lung. And the deer may die, but it may be two or three days before it dies. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So that's a, we should really do maybe even just a bonus episode on this. Cause it's an interesting subject. Cause like with the, with those nozzlers, I had, I had decent performance at range. So like 180 yards, I shot a bucket yeah. 180 yards with one and I, I didn't have a great blood trail, but uh, like for back then I was like, this is great. You know, it was, it was fine. Now I'm kind of spoiled with the yeah. ELDX cause the blood trails are so good with that bullet that I look back and I'm like, Oh, it sucked. But now the, the ELDX I've had luck at, I've shot the closest I've shot is like 18 yards, mm-hmm. and the furthest I've shot is like 225, mm-hmm. and both of them just equally devastate. Like uh, great performance at both ranges. Unlike with you know the other one where I got I got better performance at long ranges, but still not exactly what I was looking for. Yeah. But the close range stuff, like there was something happening with that bullet where it just was not doing what I wanted it to do, like at all. Yeah, and well, the partition was designed and developed. I forgot. I think it was back in the 60s when they came out with that. Uh, 
but for like elk, like really big animals. Yeah. And it's designed to mushroom and kind of push through. And I, I don't want to speak out because I'm sure there's probably some big Nosler fans, but I think it was designed also for like the bullet speeds back then, which are not nearly as fast as now. With the enhancement of bullet powders, everything's gotten quicker in yeah. the last 50, 60 years. Um, just a little bit, but that little bit can make a big difference. But yeah, that, that'd be something interesting to discuss on. But Hornady actually just came out with, and we don't work with Hornady, this is what I've had success with shooting. They just come out with their EL, the ELDX muzzleloader round, mm-hmm. which is a 340 grain projectile that I really want to test. That's 10 grains heavier than what I'm shooting now. But it's that same bolt design where you have that, that thicker base on there, but this, it's that softer tip on the front, that cup and core design, which I think they were talking about. They've killed, I was talking to the, uh, uh, one of the, the designers, the developers, bolt developers at Horny about it. And I think they killed, it was out of a, a CVA Paramount um, muzzleloader. Uh, I think it was their 45 caliber. And they shot a antelope at, what was it? I think it was 600 yards with it. And just, I mean, did not make it. Like yeah. it went straight. They dropped at that distance, which I'm getting antelope's a lot smaller than even some of our whitetails. But um, they they tested it. I think on elk and a bunch of whitetails and stuff in mule deer last year, and unbelievable performance. So I'm interested in even doing that, which is even a little bit heavier projectile. Again, you're losing the velocity, but what you're getting on the on the end return is you just have to know your bolt drop. And most guys aren't going to shoot 200 yards with their muzzleloader. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But if you're shooting if you're shooting within 50 to 150 yards. That four to five inch drop, six inch drop, is not that big of a deal, especially if you're, you know, you practice with it and you understand the performance of what that gun is. And when it hits them, it's going to sound like you're slapping a two by four against yeah. a tree. Yeah. I mean, it's just so much energy going to the animal and they just, they don't make it. Yeah. So, absolutely. All right. Uh, last question. This is a quick one from Lee. He didn't put his last name, but he's wondering when hats are going to be back in stock. Boy, have we gotten this question a lot lately. Yeah. Uh, we're aiming for September. So we got to get them ordered and everything. We're looking to order them here in the next week or two. Uh, so, uh, be looking for those in September. We're going to have some patch hat designs like, uh, actually let me grab it real quick. Similar to this one here. Uh, this is kind of the OG patch hat design. Um, we're, it's not the same exact patch, but it's going to be similar. We're going to have some of these. We're going to have some of the like goat rope type hats. And we're also going to be doing blaze orange hats. And, we're and doing a bunch of blaze orange hats. Yep, and, and doing a new patch design as well. It's a little more neutral color so that you guys can wear it in the field and not have, like, the orange and all that kind of color yeah. on it. Like stuff you could turkey hunt in or deer yep. hunt in, you know. Which so. is be, which would be awesome. So, yeah, we got, we got hats. As well as your date night hats, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. nice hat. Yeah, I saw man. somebody post about, like, you know, like the most unfortunate thing is like when you buy a nice hat that you're going to use to wear out and next thing you know you're wearing it to work and ruin the hat uh, oh i do it with all of them dude i was actually this hat here you know we were running out of these hats and i grabbed one out of our inventory i was like i'm just going to keep this one to be like a mint hat because it's like our first run of nice hats and uh i can and, tell it sat in your uh and here we it's, are it sat in your dash for quite some time yeah it sat on the dash i wore it scouting with mike the other day and now it's ruined so so much for that anyways yeah. Um, cool. All right. Well, uh, appreciate everybody listening. This has been a fun one. Uh, appreciate yep. y'all supporting us through 500 episodes, man. How yep. crazy is Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Share it with some buddies, guys. Share, keep sharing the podcast with some buddies. One of the biggest things you can help us with right now is to share the show. If you enjoy the show, share the show. Yep. And as Andy Purcell would say. <laughs> <laughs> family uh, show. Yeah, family show. We won't say it. But anyways, yeah, to share the show, guys, if you enjoyed it, share it. Uh, also, if you've been enjoying the show, leave us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts. we got a couple more reviews that just came in. Actually, I don't know if you want to read one. Just had one come in. It's pretty interesting. Uh, we'll, we'll read it on the next Okay, outro. we'll read it on the next outro. But anyways, guys, appreciate everybody leaving us reviews. Thank you all for sharing the show. And uh, to the next 500 episodes, guys. To the next 500. Cheers. We'll, we'll keep you all posted on the next episode. And you all stay Southern.